This is a recording of a lockdown Zoom. We're going to look at uh, ink washes and pen and ink today. I'm going to do a quick presentation about John Ruskin, who's an um, English critic and artist, um, and talk about his work. And then we'll get into some practice um, using those techniques. OK, I'll just share my screen. Right, so John Ruskin. Um, I was when I was looking at um, doing this. I wasn't him. I intended to start doing a presentation about when I, when I was looking for a some works and pen ink work to illustrate to, to talk about. I, I sort of uh, came across some of his uh, ink wash drawings, pen ink drawings, um, and I didn't. I know a bit about Ruskin. He he's written some some uh, a lot of books. He wrote a lot of books. He was a Victorian. He was alive in the Victorian era, and I have. Um, he wrote a book called *The Elements of Drawing*, and I have that. Uh, but he wrote a lot of other stuff, and I, I just read a bit more about him, and I discovered how much I didn't know about him. Really, he struck me as a really interesting guy. Um, so I thought I'd do a presentation about him. So that's him on the left. That's a self-portrait, one of his drawings on the right. And he was. His dates are. Um, he's alive 1819 until 1900. Yeah, and he was a critic. He wrote about a huge variety of, of uh, subjects. Uh, geology, architecture, ornithology, literature, education, botany, and political economy. And he wrote, you know, at a very a, a well-informed level about, about all of those things. He um, he was as he, alive in the Victorian time. One of the huge influences on his life were his parents. They were evangelical Christians, and that, um, as I say, had a huge influence on his life on his life throughout his life. Um, and whilst he was a very forward-thinking and modern person in many ways, he was also kind of stuck, if you like, in this groove of Victorian, um, this sort of straitjacket of Victorian values um, and the, the pressure of his parents to, to live up to their Christian beliefs and his own Christian beliefs. Um, so he, uh, yeah, he, he drew that, for instance, when he was 19, he was, uh, always had uh, showed great uh, skills and artists um, and he, he always gravitated to uh, gothic art rather than renaissance art because gothic art was the art of christianity if you like uh, renaissance looked as the name says it was the the rebirth of uh, ancient greek and roman cultures which were um, based if you like on pagan ideas to put simply um, that's a bit over simplistic but that, that's why he, he gravitated more to uh, Gothic ideas, to Gothic art and Gothic architecture. Um, and he, but he also believed in um, working from nature. So he's very forth, forward thinking in that sense. The, the art schools and the, the artists of his day were very formal, very, very governed by the sort of rules of academia in art. And he believed in working from life. Um, but he also, he, he, um, he said that the job of the artist is to observe the reality of nature, not to invent it in a studio, to render imaginatively on a canvas what he has seen and understood, free from any rules of composition. So that was his, what he felt about, about art, and that's why he gravitated towards the, the pre-Raphaelites. But he wrote um, a, a series of books called Modern Painters, Volumes 1 to 4. And he, in the first one, for instance, well, he championed Turner, he was a big fan of Turner, but also he, he thought that in it, he was sort of um, expounded this view that the old masters and, and the sort of academies, if you like, championed convention, not, not the truth of nature as he saw it. And he linked aesthetics to the divine and he argued that truth, beauty and religion were bound together and that the beautiful is a gift of God, to quote him. So those are some of the ideas that, that he thought about in his work and, and in his, uh, his response to, to art. But he was a, an ornithologist. He, he did natural history illustration all to a fantastic level. But he was a big champion of the Pre-Raphaelites. Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood were formed in 1848. Everett, John Everett Mealy, Holman Hunt, Dante Gabriel Zetti, Edward Byrne Jones, sort of main figures in it. And Mealy, uh, sorry, Ruskin, who was married to a, a woman called Effie Gray, uh, came to Scotland. They they both had links to Scotland, uh, Ruskin and Effie Gray, and they came up north with with uh, Mille to paint up here. And that uh, famous picture of Ruskin was painted by Mille in Glenfinglas, 
on that visit in 1853. And Ruskin and Everyday's marriage wasn't going well and she fell for Mele and she and Mele ran away together. Uh, she left him, so he was obviously devastated by that. But And so he sort of cut his ties with Mele, but to continue to, to champion the pre-Raphaelites. And he, he, like a lot of people of his social standing, if you like, and, and uh, wealth in the Victorian era, would go on the grand tour of Europe, go around and look at the, 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 the great sites to see, both natural and cultural, throughout Europe. And one of the, the biggest influences on his life was Venice. It was his spiritual home, if you like. And in 1851, he put a book together. He wrote this book called The Stones of Venice, about, about the city, about the architecture of the city, about the culture of the city. But he also he was also uh, important in the sort of preservation of Venice, if you like. The people in charge of Venice in that time were bent on what they called preserving Venice. And to them, that, that meant making it look and making it comply to their, their sense of good taste. So they're busy painting over it and scraping down the surfaces to make them you know, look pristine and perfect. They were scraping off the patina. So Ruskin worked against that and he and uh, William Morris, the English designer, uh, were prominent in preserving the Venice that, that we know rather than the, the, the Venice that the people of the Victorian Italy wanted to have. They, they wanted it to be left the way it was rather than changed. So he was important at that. So the, the, he, he fell for Venice because he believed that sort of the medieval architecture and history of Venice had something important to say for Victorian British society, a society in general, but Victorian British society. He felt that the, the wisdom and morality of a successful society as expressed through their Gothic and therefore Christian architecture was a thing to be learned from, a thing of value. So he published this book, the Stones of Venice, and he did these watercolours, and he, he went around, he surveyed the buildings, and he, he did paintings of the buildings there, and these watercolours were all in, in the book. But in the end, he felt that he hadn't uh, really captured what Venice was. Something about the, the feel of Venice, which he felt he hadn't quite managed to capture, but he, he always felt that Turner caught it very, very well in his, in his work. So he, you know, the, the atmosphere and, and the feeling of those sublime, if you like, a watercolours that Turner did, he felt captured Venice better than his work. So that was an important book for him and an, an, an influential book of the time. In Modern Painters 4, the final version of, of the book, he, he sort of presented the idea that, that landscape, and particularly the landscape of the Alps, which was part of, his, part of what, what he would see on his uh, grand tours, he talked about how the Alps, he, in terms of their moral and spiritual influence, on those people who lived in them and sort of social effects of the, the environment had on people. And that was a really important idea for him. He didn't think that we, we were separate from our environment, had an integral part to play in our lives. And he published a book in 1860 called Unto This Last, which was a, a, a sort of critique of the current expression of, of cap industrial capitalism as put forward by Adam Smith and people like uh, Thomas Malthus, things like that. Adam Smith and the Wealth of, Wealth of Nations. He said he thought that he, they failed to consider uh, the complexity of society and, and of social connections. And Ruskin thought that all economies and societies should be founded on social justice. That was a very uh, modern idea, if you like, to think in terms of such a, 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 an all-encompassing idea of society and, and economics and, and morality, if you like. Um, so so he, he published that book in, in 1860. In 1871, he set up the Guild of St. George, which was an attempt to kind of foster a utopian society in which he uh, applied these ideas that he'd put forward into, unto this last and gave uh, opp opportunities for education to people who wouldn't have normally had them, uh, opportunities for work. So he, that was what the Guild of St. George was about. And it still exists, it still exists today. Well, it's more of a charitable educational trust. So that was quite important idea in his work. And, and it, it kind of carried on having influence. Gandhi in 1904 came across the book and had it translated into Gujarat, which I think is his, it was his dialect. And it was a, a noted that it was an important part of his sort of philosophy and his, in his attempts to create the, a more equal and independent India. Yeah, so, so Ruskin's tentacles of influence go out quite a long way in, in, in directions that I didn't expect.
1869, he was appointed the first professor of fine art at Oxford. And in 1871, he founded the Rus Ruskin School of Drawing. And he was a very popular teacher. And his, his lectures, he used to have to deliver his lectures twice, once for the students and once for the public. The public hall wanted to hear what he had to say. So he was a, an important influencer of his day, if you like. And he, he, in, his, in his teaching and in his ideology, he challenged the mechanical methodology of, of government art schools and their formulaic classicism. He thought the teaching of art is the teaching of all things. So once again, that's a really kind of forward thinking, modern view of how art fits into the world. And in 1874, he started in the university, a project of mending roads where students would go out and, and mend roads. And it was supposed to give them the benefit or a better understanding of the virtues of wholesome manual labor. And it had a, it was a, a popular thing and, and uh, Oscar Wilde apparently was one of the people who took part in it, but the university didn't really like it and they sued it pretty quick, I think. So he had this really broad idea of what, of how art fitted in with society and what place it should have, that sort of thing. But in, it was in 1877 that he had two large events in his life. The one that most people know about and that, that I knew about was his libel case with Whistler, which I'll come to in a second, but he also suffered what is referred to as a religious unconversion when the, he rejected the evangelical Christianity of, he'd been brought up with, apparently as the result of scholarship which undermined the literal truth and absolute authority of the, the faith as he understood it. And that had a huge, huge impact on it. And I think it was probably linked up to the, the liable trial, difficult to separate things. But he did go back to his faith. But the other one, the, the, the other big thing in his life was the, the liable trial with Whistler, where Whistler painted famous picture, Nocturne in black and gold, that's it there. And it was a falling rocket, so it's sparks falling from a rocket. It's basically an abstract painting way before uh, abstraction was ever really thought of. Ruskin hated it and said so. So Whistler took him to, to, to court for libel and, and you can imagine they discussed what, what was art in a court, like court of law, which I'm sure was great fun. But in the end, uh, Whistler won, but the judge ordered Ruskin to pay a, a farthing's damages and he ordered that court costs be shared. Ruskin was actually okay. He gained his court costs through public subscription. He was a popular guy and people were happy to give him the money. So he paid for his court costs that way, but Whistler became bankrupt and in effect him much more for a much longer time. But those two events, the religious, religious unconversion and the trial had a, had a huge effect on him. And as I say, he was never quite the same again, but he was, as I sort of tried to show a bit of, a real modernist, you know, Cezanne talked about creating a Poussin after nature. That's just Cezanne top left, that's Poussin bottom right. And Ruskin was very similar. He wanted to, to create an important art, if you like, if you want to use that word. But he wanted to create art from nature, from, from observing nature, which was not the, the, the common practice in those days. So he was very forward thinking in that day, but held back by these restraining Victorian values. But he, he had a huge influence on his world and the world afterwards. Various architects like Le, Cor Le Corbusier, Frank Lloyd Wright and Walter Gropius, the founder of the, the Bauhaus, all cite him as an influence. These are all things that I didn't know, which is why I decided to do the presentation about him. But the thing that took, took me to him was when I looked at his ink wash drawings, which he, he was so good at, like that one there. And we're going to have a go at that. We're not going to do anything that complex in the two exercises I've got in mind, just a sort of introduction to it for those of you who aren't don't know the idea so well working with ink washes. So I'll just stop the, the presentation. That one there's done from uh, Ruskin's when he was on the Grand Tour. There you go. And I will go to my hands. There we go. So first thing we're going to do is a very simple thing based on this. It's an owl pending owl drawing. And it comes from this image here, which we're then going to do afterwards. And that's a drawing by a guy called uh, Giovanni Francesco Barbieri Guercino. Uh, Italian, I would guess. I didn't really think much about him. I just thought the image was nice. So we're going to work with that as the first exercise. Um, put that there. And really simple. And, and I'm doing this just as a way of working into uh, some of the couple of ideas that I want to work with in the, in the ink wash thing. And I've got a couple of uh, washes here, a lighter one and a darker one. And I've got a pot of water and I've got a, a, a pot of ink for maybe doing darker things again. Yeah, so I've got two different washes, lighter, darker, and I've got this uh, drawing nib. 
which I'll probably use in the drawings. And I've got that pot, so two, two washes, light dark, and a pot of, of ink. So I'm not putting them in case it's not over. Um, so the first thing I want to do is just a, a, a quick drawing of this owl. And I've also got a hairdryer to dry things more quickly. So I'm going to give myself a quick pencil sketch and I will do it darker so you can see it uh, of what the, you know, work with then if, you, if you're going to do this. So uh, I think the drawing's called Man with an Owl on a Stick, obviously. So you go, quick sketch, and I'm, I'm going to do one more show. Let's start off with a, with a, with a, a light wash over the whole thing. And it's, I, I chose this partly because it's a really uh, quick sketch of this part of his drawing, which we'll look at in more detail later, is a really quick sketch. So there's that. Now, you might want to lift, if you want to lift sort of some washes out, you can do it with the brush. You can dry your brush off. Which I'll do is squeeze it out, and you can you can lift off while the ink's still wet if you want. So I'm going to dry that with the hair dryer to start off with. And give it a second wash, um, which I'm going to, before I put the wash on, I'm going to put a wee bit of um, well, dirty water now, uh, just in the sort of bottom bit so it spreads out a wee bit. Uh, and the darker wash, yeah, it's darker wash. Um, So I guess the idea I'm thinking about is, is two washes and then um, and then using the pen and ink, then using yeah, then using the pen. So I'm, I've actually made put some darker ink again into this. That and then there's your other eye there, a couple of ears. So I'm going to give that a dry. Oops. And then work into that with with a pen. So just take the the pen and, and start working the linear way. Now I think he's done it with a with a brush in the original. Yeah, I feel like that eye could be a bit darker. Kind of difficult to see what the claws are doing in the drawing. Yeah, probably 
In this instance, might be better with the with a small brush. Start off with just the scale of the marks a wee bit small with this. That might work better, yeah. That might have worked better from the beginning. So anyway, that'll probably do. So a quick drawing. So the idea behind the drawing was uh, two washes and then, well, I started off with the, with the pen, but in, in that instance, it was the brush, the brush worked better. Two washes and then detail, if you like, want to put it that way. Uh, so that's what we're going to do. So we're going to work with um, a bigger drawing next, the, the main drawing that comes from next. I'm just going to put that to the side. Um, I'll dry it off first, hang on. So two washes and then a pen or two washes and a brush. So that's the, the drawing we're going to work with. Um, that's a, a, an example I did of earlier on, that kind of thing, bringing in a lighter wash, a darker wash, and then some detail, some contour work to finish it off. So that's how we're gonna do that. Now I've done, uh, as I've done a few with a few of these uh, drawings, uh, quartered the paper off like that. So you can see it's, it's easier to work out where the the elements of the drawing might fit on your piece of paper if you want to do it that way. So the, the piece of paper I'm working with is pretty much A4. It's 29 by uh, 29 high by 21 across. Um, and the, obviously the, the quartering goes in the middle. So that's um, 14 and a half and 10 and a half across this crossing. And and the, the photograph or the, the picture of the drawing is quartered in the same way. So we can work out where things go. So we're looking at things like you know where does where does this hat cross that line where does the chin cross line how far is it from from this center point where does this the, the shoulder cross the line that sort of thing that's what that that's one of the things that the uh that's really what the the quartering idea is looking at the owls there so i'm going to start with with this and also looking at this shape looking at the negative shape outside of the hat here um, outside of the, of the figure and when I draw I think yes you can see that uh, I start off by just kind of feeling for where things are but in the context of those the reference of those lines that's a bit wider
So here I'm just looking at that wee negative space between the fingers as a way of working out the shape of the hand um, as much as anything else. So that'll do. So I'm, I'm going to uh, start with the wash now. Before I do that, I'm going to rub out these uh, guiding lines so they don't uh, stay in the end result. The final outcome. But they can be handy for, for helping us find uh, where things are when you've got a squared up image. So I'm not going to use the wash over the whole thing. I'm going to leave um, the lighter areas, but, but to, and we may bring in, we'll bring in the second wash over parts of the first wash. So there, that'll do for the first wash. Try that off. So second wash is darker, but I'm not going to do it over over everything the way the first wash is. But more selective now. You in the image on the well on the camera you can't really see the uh, there's an eye in there but i'm just going to go over it and i'll bring that back later too much ink
So I might just leave it at that. Hang on. Try that off. Tuck her in there. So there, that'll do for the two washes, and I'll start drawing with the pen now, um, which I think should work okay with this one. So just picking out them um, edges, really mostly in this drawing, and um, some little detail perhaps. Here and there.
So, nearly there, I think. Just, um, apart from that big blob mistake I made, that's kind of it there. So just catching the um, contours, the edges, a wee bit of detail, a few things missing. There we go, that'll do. So, uh, two washes and pen and ink, and you get that sort of result. Uh, so that's worth practicing. Like I said, this drawing, if you want to try that drawing yourself, it's called by a guy called Giovanni Francesco Barbieri Guercino. Uh, it's called Man with an Owl on a Stick, I think, surprisingly. If you want to have a go at that um, with some washes. And we're going to do, try another one now, just to repeat the process. Um, so this is what I want to do here. The, we're going to work with this still life. It's a still life with carnations. And I'm aware you can't see the carnations very well. Um, we'll try and work through that. So it's just these, uh, you know, a vase and a, a bowl with some, some a lemon and a pear on a stripy surface. And it's kind of divided up similarly to the previous one with the, with the quarter paper. But I, I deliberately made this, the line of this surface correspond to this line here. And, you know, this is almost quartered. So I'll just put that in there. And once we've worked out what I, where all of it is, we'll um, get rid of the quartered line. So I'll start off with the, with, the, um, with the vase, I think, working out as best I can where that is. Um, it's doing something like... Like that. Okay, I'm gonna do. And then there's the stripes. The stripes get thicker as they get closer to us. So this stripe here and that stripe there and stripe that stripe there, they're actually the same width in if you're standing in front of a piece of material. But because they, it gets further away, you see less of that stripe. So they get slightly fatter as they get closer to us. And the same with this stripe here is thinner than, than this stripe here in the red ones. So we'll try to reflect that in the drawing. That, that this can you get an idea of where the bowl is when it cuts across the the um, the lines? Do oops, Let's that stuff out. So take a position of the carnations. Don't need any detail in them just now.
So that's pretty much the um, the structure of the drawing. There's a, this shadow here, so I'm not going to um, draw that in. I'm just going to paint that in with, with the brush. So uh, there's more uh, simple washes, if you like. So I'm going to start doing the washes. I'm going to leave the this completely blank. I'm going to leave the, the vase blank and the, the white stripes and a bit of the bowl uh, white as well. So just start off with a, a wash over the um, carnations. Oh. I've done it over the bars. So you can, if you make a mistake like that, you can just, if you take clean water, you can clean it out a bit. There you go, you can lift out a bit with the, um, with the water also. There's something I forgot. I forgot to take out the um, the lines of the quartering of the paper first. You should do that before you put your washes on. Um, but that's okay. There you go. That's all right. Um, so I'll dry that off and then I'll come in and put a second wash on. So the um, the carnations have got sort of wee details, they've got the sort of um, gaps between the leaves and that sort of thing. So I'm just going to put them in with And as I say, I'm aware you can't see the carnations very well. I'm just trying to give them a bit more variety to... to uh,
So that's quite good for the carnations. I'm just going to dry that off. Do this first. I'm going to give the um, the uh, stripes another wash, but a dark wash. So I'm working relatively quickly. Um, so I'm not necessarily taking the most care in around about these little details, you know, but um, sometimes with, with this sort of idea with the, with the washes, that works really well because you can bring in the detail, the control with the, um, with the pen later on. So that's okay, that's looking all right. So I'm going to work on this, uh, the shadow uh, on the wall. So I'm the, the shadow across the dark stripes here needs to be the dark one again, but the, I'm not going to, the one on the wall here can just be fairly sort of simple with the, with the lighter wash. A bit wide maybe, I'll do this. Hang on. Okay, try that off. It's shining to be darker than I intended to be. There must have been some some of the darker ink still in the brush, but that's okay.
Okay, so I'm going to uh, work with the pen and ink now. And I can come back in after um, I've worked with this a bit and um, do some more washes. So that the ink is uh, waterproof. So that I like these kind of wobbly edges that the carnations have. In the edge of the vase as well.
and the edge of the fruit also. And that's I'm just going to do the contours of this, so pick this out. Like that. Stop for that. And the edge of the bowl also. Hey, and there's too much more to it. Probably a bit more to the fruit here. Um, a bit more up here, perhaps. Like I say, I'm sorry you can't see the carnations very clearly. Okay, but hopefully you get the idea. So, uh, one more wash on the fruit, I think. We put those a wee bit darker there, which we meant to do. Um, and dry it off and maybe leave it at that. Hang on. So, there you go. Let's, um, I'm going to leave it there. So, the idea today was uh, wash, wash drawings and then pen and ink, wash and pen and ink. So, a couple of washes, maybe a light one and a dark one. Um, dry them off and then work into them with the, with the pen, sort of mixed success today. Really, that was the other drawing there. The guy, the man with an owl on a stick. Okay. Uh, and it was the, I say the initial um, motivation for the presentation was uh, John Ruskin, who I was looking at, looking at his um, ink wash drawings, which are fantastic. Uh, and so that's why I did the presentation. But have a presentation about him. Have a look at Ruskin. He's a really interesting guy. Um, he's full of contradictions, uh, great achievements in his life, quite a lot of sadness as well in some things. Um, but uh, yeah, I've got the I've got his elements of drawing, which is actually a, a really good book. I've, it's got some really good stuff in it uh, about drawing. It's not the main uh, book that I look at um, when I'm when I'm thinking about drawing. That one is the it's that one there, drawing projects. Um, but you know, he, he, it's difficult to read, really difficult to read. He never uses one word when 10 will do, very sort of Victorian way of expressing things, but there's some really interesting ideas in there. So uh, that, there you go, two washes and pen and ink and John Ruskin. I will edit this down, put it on YouTube and I will see you all again soon. Okay, cheerio.